What we first love, we love forever. Our real biographies are not our resumes. The real biographies are a history of our affections. First and foremost, books. In her book on beauty, Elaine Scarry says that when we love something, we have the urge to replicate it. How is text loved? In my case, it's with light pencil underlining or stars or marginalia, comments about lightning bolts, ideas, or new words. Not surprisingly, the next leap is to words on the page. In my case, a daily journal writing habit that has evolved over 50 years. Always a sketchbook with unlined pages, each entry dated and usually beginning with good morning. Because of this, I have a record of exactly what was happening in the weeks one year ago today, as the world started to shut down with a pandemic. Edison High School, where I taught for over 30 years, was presenting Hello, Dolly. High school theatrical productions, despite varying levels of artistic success, never fail to give me such hope and this one did not disappoint. It may not have been Barbara Streisand up there on the stage, but it was a young woman earnest and energetic. At Elmira College, 12 young women appeared on stage for an amazing play about a girl's soccer team called the Wolves. It was written by Sarah DeLapp. At the Clemens Center, the orchestra of the Southern Finger Lakes performed with a youth orchestra who played a beautiful Brahms piece. That same week at the Arnett Art Museum, poets were visiting the photorealistic exhibit called High Fidelity and writing accompanying poems. Little did any of us know a year ago that all of these events would end. Over the years when I visit a museum, I take pictures of hands. Focusing on just one part of a portrait is a form of the poetic technique called synecdoche, where the part represents the whole. These photographs help me relive a few hours spent in favorite museums, places where I always feel like I'm walking through history in deep time. Here are some of the women's hands that I've captured. Handwork, hard work and easy. How a coin is placed between the thumb and the pointer finger. Payment for what? The strength of marble hands or those resting on linens near a silver spoon and an emerald glass. And the hand that holds flowers always keeps some of the sweetness, so the saying goes. Cross my heart and hope to live bread and vine, golden arrows, a hand that paints the cosmos, or rest from a day's labor, hands burnished with strength, pouring water for a child's bath, hands at the beginning and the endings of stories. None of these women's hands were sculpted by women. On the theatrical front, each production is one that exists for the audience in a pocket of time, an experience that can never be relived exactly the same way again. Earnest voices always remind audiences not to take pictures during a production, but they never say anything about right before or after. So I've also tried to snap a picture of the set or a curtain call at each production. Few of the plays out of the hundreds I've seen were written by women. With theaters closed for over a year, 
I often think about the ghost lights left glowing in the darkness on stages all over the world. In terms of the piano, scouring volumes of sheet music in the house, I found relatively few pieces written by women. And I have to tell you, these treasure hunts fueled some feminist angst. So during this past year, I've sleuthed out piano music written by women composers. Just to note before we begin, I considered organizing all of this in a historical or thematic, maybe alphabetic fashion, and decided on a method a little more freeform, something I like to think of as the Fandango method. It's not patent pending and nowhere to be found in the lively art of writing. Teresa Carino, born in Caracas in December of 1853, listened to her father play the piano. As soon as her fingers could depress the keys, he gave her lessons. She composed the piece you've been listening to, La Sommeil d'Enfant. Her family moved to New York City when she was eight years old, and on November 25th, she made her debut at Irving Hall performing a rondo brilliant. During the fall of 1863, when she was 10, Carino performed for Abraham Lincoln at the White House. For an encore, she played an improvisation of Lincoln's favorite song, Listen to the Mockingbird. After Teresa Carino's death, the city of Caracas built a museum in tribute to her, and they also arranged for a crater on the planet Venus to be named for her as well. This is very close to being stellified, made into a star. A not too shabby tribute, I'd say. Let's back up a century. Cross the ocean. Maria Szmanowska was born in Warsaw. Listen to her Nocturne in B-flat major. Maria became a virtuoso pianist and composer, touring a decade ahead of Franz Liszt and Clara Schumann. And she eventually settled in St. Petersburg, where she was court composer to the Empress of Russia, Alexandra Fyodorovna. She died of cholera in the St. Petersburg epidemic in 1831. In 1789, the year that Maria was born, Elizabeth Louise Viget Lebrun painted this self-portrait with her daughter, Julie. Throughout Elizabeth's career, she painted 660 portraits and 200 landscapes. But here, Julie, how old do you think she is? Five or six? And she has stayed that age for these 232 years. Let's fast forward a bit. When Joni Mitchell wrote this song in 1968, she was living in the Chelsea section of New York City. On the opposite coast, Joan Didion was keeping her journals and exploring California culture. Here, in a photo from 1966, she holds her adopted daughter, Quintana, whose name she chose by flying her hands Ouija board style over a map of Mexico. And here she is at about age seven. She probably would have heard Joni Mitchell's Chelsea Morning on the radio. And on one particular Chelsea Morning, Joan Didion and her daughter went to the Art Institute in Chicago. Since seven-year-olds are really still more like fillies than small adults, she probably zipped and raced from gallery to gallery, her museum tag flying behind her. And as she flew up the grand staircase where she saw this painting, she called out to her mother, who painted this? To which her mom replied, Georgia O'Keeffe. And Quintana said, I need to talk to her. I imagine the conversation that might have taken place between Georgia O'Keeffe and Quintana. 
This child probably felt like the creator of these magnificent clouds had to be as spectacular as the painting itself. I concur. What I do know is that Georgia O'Keeffe painted this landscape of double lavenders, blues, and greens that seems otherworldly. In her words, God told me that if I painted the mountain enough, I could have it. Wherever we are, you and I, we have it too. Let's take a moment to breathe and listen to lullabies. Those pieces usually in 6-8 time meant to get babies and their mothers in the groove. In this book, the editors of the Metropolitan Museum have collected lullabies and artwork from all over the world in different eras. None of them have a composer or lyricist listed, given that they were most likely passed down through generations. But my guess is that Anonymous was indeed a woman. The oldest lullaby is what the first mother sang to the first child. This tablet holds the cuneiform lyrics to a Babylonian lullaby, whose translation begins, Little one who dwelled in darkness, now you come and seen the sun. Why the crying? Why the worries? And the text ends with, May you settle into slumber, sweet as plum wine, deep as love. So we leave the lullabies behind, but for some of us, the melodies linger. Amy Marcy Beach, who was born in 1867 in New Hampshire, composed this song called Canoeing. She was the only child of a paper manufacturer. When she was a one-year-old, she sang her own songs, and at age two, she wrote lullabies. At age four, she composed songs while visiting her grandfather, all the more remarkable because she had no access to a piano. She was completely self-taught, no lessons, no musical schooling at a conservatory. She was also a synesthetic, seeing certain colors and certain keys. In high school, she performed several recitals with the Boston Symphony. She married a man who was two years older than her father, and he forbade her from performing, unless it was once a year for charity. His position in upper-class Boston society, intellectual and artistic, but also somewhat stuffy, imposed rather strict standards of respectability and gentility. The beaches seldom traveled, and Amy had little exposure to other worlds. She devoted all of her time to composition. In an interview in Etude magazine in 1904, the journalist William Armstrong proclaimed, when she is not composing, she is very interested in housework. Hmm. After her husband's death, she traveled to Europe where she performed and lived for four years. 
She spent the latter part of her life living in residential hotels in New York City. Christine Amer, in her book Unsung, noted that Amy's alleged love of housekeeping must have died with her husband. Let's fandango along, leaving Amy Beach in Manhattan. And how about we move quickly north to the Bronx and listen to Valerie Capers' jazz piece called Monin. She grew up near this cinema, I bet. Her dad was a musician and a postman, and when she was six, she had a bout with strep throat that entered her bloodstream and settled in her optic nerve. She became blind and spent three months in Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. She learned Braille at the Institute for the Blind and began studying classical piano at age 11. Hearing Bud Powell and other bebop players on the radio inspired her lifelong desire to play jazz. Valerie graduated from the Juilliard School of Music and for several years served on the faculty of the Manhattan School of Music. This is her sweet Mr. Jelly Roll. Pretty zippy, right? In Manhattan, did Valerie ever cross paths, I wonder, with Faith Rheingold? I'd like to think so. In addition to wanting to talk to these women, I have the impulse to get them in a room together with a cup of tea or a good stiff drink. And I would blissfully slingshot a thousand questions. Faith grew up in Harlem, her mother a fashion designer, and her father an avid storyteller. Despite growing up in Harlem in the Depression, she insists, this does not mean that I was poor or oppressed. Hey, Faith lived around the corner from Langston Hughes. Look here, over all of New York in its spangly bridge, this little girl flies effortlessly into the night sky and her future. So yes, I want to talk to these women who for thousands of years have been makers. How about you? How did you learn what you did? Why your particular calling? Let's start at the beginning. The chapel and we're gonna get married. Why not start with Adam and Eve, right? And we're, we're listening to the Dixie Cups, by the way. Eunice Golden paints them side by side, but the panels seem to have an invisible line between them. Eden's brightness seems confetti-like, ready for a paradise party. The writer Natalie Angier crashes the party with a different take on this origin story. In her book, Woman, An Intimate Geography, Angier bemoans the fact that, in her words, Women are the chip goods on the remainder table. X means to cancel out. Those are our chromosomes, our thick necklace of genes. Sappho was born in 620 BCE on the island of Lesbos. She was referred to as the poetess, just as Homer was called the poet. Plato hailed her as the Tenth Muse. Her poems are praised as spontaneous, simple, direct, and honest. One of the fragments of Sappho's poems reads, I tell you, someone will remember us in the future. We do remember her, but in a future, we're now at the Mora refugee camp on her home island of Lesbos, 13,000 women, men, and children are living in a camp that was built for 3,000 refugees. She would surely weep. According to Pliny the Elder, the first woman artist was a woman named Debutates, who traced a silhouette of her lover on the wall. Hildegard of Bingen, who lived in the High Middle Ages, was a German Benedictine abbess, writer, composer, philosopher, mystic, and visionary. 
She composed sacred monophonic music, which I've always loved. As a child raised in the Catholic Church, it has always rung out as the pure language of the divine. The musical group Anonymous Four provides the background music for her words. As the sun, the moon, and stars appear in water, so writings, sermons, virtues, and certain human actions take form from me and gleam. Hildegard also invented an alternative alphabet which serve more or less as a secret code or perhaps an intellectual one. She invented words that correspond in, to a neglected list of nouns. She used this lingua ignata supposedly to increase solidarity among the nuns. Francesca Caccini composed this music around 1600. Artemisia Gentilici lived and worked in Venice in the mid-17th century, and she was most likely permitted to be an onlooker at the Accademia de Incogniti. Orazio, her teacher, recognized Artemisia's talent, and in his workshop, she learned to prepare colors, how to pound and mix them with oil, how to arrange them on the palette from light to dark, her amazing achievements were often overshadowed by a horrific trial for rape when she was a young girl. In recent years, she has been given recognition for her incredible talent and has had major exhibitions, including at the National Gallery in London. In 2018, a David and Goliath painting, once believed to be the work of a Roman painter, was finally reattributed to Gentileschi after a restoration carried out by Simon Gillespie. Elisabetta Serrani painted throughout her short life. In the 27 years she lived, she made over 200 paintings. Her Virgin and Child, painted in 1663, depicts Mary not as the remote Queen of Heaven, but as a very real young mother. She wears a turban, which was favored by the peasant women in Bologna, and gazes adoringly at the plump baby wriggling on her lap. He, in turn, seems to be crowning her with a wreath of flowers. Cécile Chaminade's La Lissongera accompanies Clara Peter's paintings of relatively humble objects. She is the only Flemish woman known to have specialized in such paintings in the early 17th century. At the age of 15, Parisian painter Elizabeth Louise Viget Le Grun was making enough money from her portrait painting to support herself, her widowed mother, and her younger brother. She was Marie Antoinette's favorite painter. Scholars estimate she produced more than 600 paintings. She was forced to flee France after the French Revolution. And Rosalba Carrera, in her younger years, specialized in portrait miniatures. Her later pastel work appealed to Rococo styles for its soft edges and flattering surfaces. The painting on the left is entitled Muse, the painting on the right is a self-portrait as Winter, done in 1731. She lost her sight late in life. Lavinia Fontana is regarded as the first female career artist in Western Europe as she relied on commissions for her income. Her husband served as her agent and helped her raise their 11 children. Here's Lavinia's portrait of the noblewoman with its exquisite wandering of golden threads. Berta Morisot, the artist in this photograph, was tutored by Joseph Richard. Early on in her training, he warned her parents that, quote, in the upper class milieu, her talent will, talent will be revolutionary, I might say catastrophic. Women in the upper class could dabble, but beyond that, talent could be problematic. 
Lila Cabot Perry, a member of the distinguished Boston family, might have disagreed. She started art training at age 36 and saw her first Impressionist painting in Paris at age 41. Monet's paintings literally changed her life. For nine years, her family rented a house near Gévernay, and though Monet took no students, he became her friend and advised her. Later, she spent years in Japan studying that art and being influenced by it, much as Van Gogh was. In the mid-19th century, Louise Ferenc enrolled at the Conservatoire in Paris after having studied piano and composition with a teacher named Anton Reicha. When she enrolled as a student, though, females were barred from taking composition uh, classes. She later taught at the Conservatoire for many years and ironically composed many etudes like the one that you're listening to that became standards for piano students. Her husband, a flautist, started a publishing company to help his wife publish her work. How do we learn? How do we get there? Joan Snyder, who painted this field of berries, confessed, when I started to paint, it was like I was speaking for the very first time. I mean, I felt like my whole life I had never spoken. I had never been heard. I had never said anything that had any meaning. Truly, what we make makes us. In 1942, Ruth Asawa's father, Umakichi, a 60-year-old farmer who had been living in the U.S. for 40 years, was arrested by FBI agents and taken to a camp in New Mexico. The family did not see him for over two years. In April, Ruth was sent along with her mother and five siblings to the Santa Anita racetrack in California, where they lived for five months in horse stalls. Among the detainees were animators from Walt Disney Studios, who taught Ruth and her friends art in the grandstands of the racetrack. Later, Ruth's family was sent to Arkansas, where they lived in a tar paper barrack in Block 13, surrounded by watchtowers and barbed wire fences. Nonetheless, Ruth became an artist. In her head were memories of barbed wire fences, but in her heart and hands were these delicate lantern-like objects resembling giant dangly earrings suspended from the ceiling. She learned how to knit wire by watching basket weavers. Her aim was to define the air while letting air remain air. Here she is making her flowing wire sculptures while five of her children play. She had this to say, I hold no hostilities for what happened. I blame no one. Sometimes good comes through adversity. I would not be who I am today had it not been for the internment. And I like who I am. Even the U.S. Post Office has commemorated her. So how does a woman learn? Lucy Martin Lewis is a Native American potter from the Sky City Mesa. She uses a clay called kaolin, which is dug from a secret site that is considered sacred. The clay turns white when fired, but it's hard to work with and more fragile than the other local clays. She follows a 2,000 year old tradition. She had nine children. Seven of them went on to be potters. Lucy Martin Lewis learned from the women in her village, but most of the women whose work we have seen and listened to thus far have primarily learned from fathers, brothers, or husbands who could give them access to the materials, tools, and training to create art. Louise Nevelson's father worked in a lumberyard, 
Is it surprising that the daughter turned in this direction? Artists are converted to art by art itself, but then what? Those wealthy enough could study with experts in their field, but were often limited in that women were not allowed to participate in class with live models, and that was how artists primarily learned anatomy and the human form. Women were also discouraged from en plein air painting unless accompanied by their husbands. Camille Claudel worked as Rodin's model and later apprentice. Critics said her work was too sensual. In the 19th century, sculpture by women was not prevalent. Supposedly, it was unsuitable, messy, and women did not possess enough strength. Augustus Savage flourished in the Harlem Renaissance in the 1930s. She moved to New York City with $4.60 in her pocket, found a job as an apartment caretaker, and enrolled in Cooper Union School of Art. She was a sculptor, art teacher, and community art program director. Antonia Brico was born in 1902 to an unwed teenager in Rotterdam. She was given up to adoptive parents who emigrated to America as soon as Antonio's birth mother tried to get her back. When she was 10, a doctor recommended that she cure her nail-biting habit by taking up the piano, which she fell in love with immediately. Conductor Antonio Brico made her debut with the Berlin Philharmonic in 1930 and in 1933 conducted a second concert, but she was denied a third appearance because the baritone, John Charles Thomas, refused to work with a woman conductor. Years later, Brico formed the New York Women's Symphony to prove finally that women, women could be competent musicians. The pianist Jose Itubi had claimed that women were incapable of greatness in either music or sport. Conductor Brico challenged him to bring a group of men musicians to compete against a group of women before a panel of blindfolded judges. Well, he hastily backed down, saying, <coughs> I've been misquoted. At a concert in New York City, where the tickets were 50 cents a piece, 15,000 people attended. Judy Collins, who had been Antonia's student, paid her a tribute by making a documentary about her life, Antonia, a Portrait of a Woman. Meet Hiromi, who was born in Hamatsu, Japan. She started learning piano at age six, where she too, along with Amy Marcy Beach, was a synesthetic. And when she graduated, she spent time writing jingles for Nissan. And then she enrolled at the Berklee College of Music in Boston. And after graduating, has performed at jazz concerts and festivals all over the world. This song of hers, entitled Ciao a la Creme, would be perfect to rev you up for a few hours of housework, were you so inclined. But the big question is, how can you go to paradise when the dishes aren't done? Domesticity, women, and art. Now there's a topic. Ostensibly, Nabokov didn't even fold his own napkins. And Thoreau, he sent his laundry home for his mother to do. Here's some artwork to shed light on that topic. Now how about this is a different kind of Queen's Gambit. Ironing board captures refrigerator, which needs to be cleaned out, moldy food chucked. Sofa checkmates yellow plastic bucket. Toni Morrison had something to say on this whole topic. We are traditionally rather proud of ourselves, she says, 
for having slipped creative work in there between domestic chores and obligations. I'm not so sure we should receive an A plus for that. Oh, but uh oh, for an A plus in everything, right? Listen to Rachel Portman's compositions from a book of piano solos, Ask the River. She has composed music for over a hundred film scores, including Snowflower and the Secret Fan and Chocolat. If we were together in real time, dear friends, I would offer you a chocolate right now. Speaking of treats, how about we take a look at artists and their depictions of family? Marisol Escobar creates these women with eyes ready to scan in all directions, a trait that would be quite handy in keeping track of children and animals. Louise Bourgeois is perhaps most famous for her Maman Spider, a giant sculptural portrait inspired, supposedly, by her own mother. However, when raising her three children in a small apartment, she moved from sculpture to painting to printmaking. Talk about the ultimate downsizing. In 1994, she sketched her children here in the bathtub. In the accompanying exhibition catalog, she said, this is the bathroom at 18th Street. Everything is exactly the same. The cabinet, the tub with the feet, it's very accurate. I'm asked all the time, but I never say it was a lot of work to get through the day. It's really something to have three children and also try to work. But they're happy here. It's very tender. So there are the children in front of us and the ancestors preceding us. Hung Lu talks about her artistic vision, including the summoning of ghosts. Tomo Mori says, my heart fills up when I look into my daughter's eyes and imagine the lives of her ancestors. In this installation, hundreds of small mosaic-like fabric squares create a waterfall image vertically, progressing horizontally to symbolize time, and it comes full circle. Jane Quick to see Smith calls up the ghost of her Native American ancestors. And Betty Brickle envisions a more disastrous fairy tale ending in this garment entitled Sleeping Beauty. Elena Katz Chernin is a Soviet born pianist and composer who studied in Moscow and now lives and works in Sydney, Australia. She wrote a piece called Deep Sea Dreaming for the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games opening ceremony. In a book entitled The Face, Daniel McNeil describes a portrait as a wandering piece of reputation. It can last thousands of years. A likeness peels off a bit of the self. It is both shape and sense and tug in a sea of faces, a sea of humanity, in a world where we've got instant images at our disposal and selfie sticks rising up like absurd lollipops, do we still have a place for portraiture? When Michelle Obama wanted her portrait painted, she chose Amy Sherald, and the resulting painting is something very different from the photograph. Amy's work has subsequently received a great deal of national attention. Many of the portraits that she does are of people not as famous as Michelle going about their day-to-day -day business of living. But other self-portraits? The artist here added this inscription to her painting. I, Katarina von Hemmesen, painted myself, age 20. She seems so proud of herself, and given that the year was 1585, Katerina didn't want some man taking all of the credit, I bet. 
Legions of women artists have painted their own portraits. When these women face a mirror and a canvas, do they paint themselves as they see themselves or as they wish to be seen? Pensive? Defiant? Etunde Asamba claims her heritage in this self-portrait, as does Maria Izikered. Chantelle Joff's thick brush strokes strike an elemental chord, and Kathy Kollowitz's eyes seem to hold the pain of a thousand years. And Alyssa Monks claims a desire to cleanse her pain with her self-portrait. Adrian Piper drew this self-portrait intentionally exaggerating her black heritage. Yako Kusama creates a multi-pattern wonder here. And Frida drapes herself with birds and animals. Lois Malu Jones paintbrushes in hand, seems determined before her canvas. And Jetta Batescu, typewriter handy, poses while her husband clicks away. Alexandria Gallagher re-examines our bad rep with that apple incident. And Jenny Granholm, a photographic artist from Finland, deliberately hides her face in this self-portrait, explaining, if society doesn't value you for more than your appearance, how are you supposed to believe in yourself? And Cher Gill, a pioneer of modern Indian art, believes that Paul Gauguin's paintings of Tahitian women displayed their bodies in ways that smacked of exploitation. She challenged his idealized nudes in this painting entitled Self-Portrait is a Tahitian. Defiantly, she does not face the viewer or acknowledge their gaze. I just love this portrait Colleen Berry has made. Oh dear, who let her in here? <laughs> with women and how they picture themselves? Who is this woman with nothing better to do than lounge around snagging an oversized drapery tassel as a bracelet? Why, she must have snuck in as a prelude to Alice Neal's brave and real self-portrait. Maggie Hambling painted this portrait of Dorothy Hodgkin, the Nobel Prize winning chemist. Note how she has four hands constantly in motion, the ultimate multitasker, global thinker, and icon of old age. The composer Janine de Lorenzo wrote this piece of music for Marguerite, who was her piano teacher. She tells this story of her relationship with music in her childhood. My mother asked me if I'd like to have piano lessons, and I said I would, not really understanding what that would mean. A friend recommended a teacher named Marguerite Penduvid, who taught from her home. I always remember walking into her home for the first time at eight years old, being greeted by a buxom woman with a Dutch accent, wearing a pink dress and long black boots, and two enormous chow chow dogs that resembled small lions. There were two pianos in her living room, the upright on which she taught her students, and the grand that was hers. And always there was the present packet of Salem cigarettes sitting on the piano, which she would smoke during my lessons. She'd light her Salem cigarette, take a puff, draw back the smoke, and as she blew it out, she'd say, play me the Bach. And in a cloud of smoke, I'd find the keys on the piano at my starting place to launch into the Bach prelude. Janine also remembers listening to her teacher play compositions before she would attempt to learn them and weeping at their beauty. 
Professionally, Janine has composed for television and film, and for a number of years played the piano for Cirque du Soleil. She now lives in Colorado, and when I ordered the music from her, she sent a handwritten note thanking me and telling me she hoped I enjoyed learning her pieces. At one point a few years ago, she had an accident and broke both of her wrists. The recuperation was slow, and she wrote this piece called Reaching Upwards after this painful healing time. How do any of us hear one another or manage to cross over into someone else's suffering and make that core connection called empathy? Art, I think, does this in really unique ways. This painting by Hung Lu is entitled Mother and Daughter. In China, after high school, she underwent four years of enforced proletarian re-education, working in the field several days a week. During that time, she took photographs with a smuggled camera and made sketches on postcard size paintings. Typically, she veiled her images with washes and drips of diluted paint, simultaneously preserving and obscuring them. Here, two women drag an unseen boat upstream, the effect like seeing history through a rain-spattered window. The Japanese have a practice of gilding the cracked spots in pottery, the idea being that we are stronger after having been broken. I've always thought, too, that each sorrow opens our hearts to a whole swathe of people who have suffered similarly. Art is the bridge. Look. Just one example from theater. There could be thousands here. Kitchen Theater in Ithaca presented a one-woman show in April 2009 called Grounded, written by George Brandt and performed by Kate McCluggage, a New York equity actor. Kitchen Theater described the play as follows. An unexpected pregnancy ends an ace fighter pilot's career in the sky. Reassigned to operate the military drones from a windowless trailer outside Las Vegas, she hunts terrorists by day and returns to her family each night. As the pressure to track a high-profile target mounts, the boundaries begin to blur between the desert in which she lives and the one she patrols half a world away. So going forward, what we set our sights on, destruction, or preservation. Diane Ackerman in The Human Age asked the question, what sort of stewards of the future planet will today's digital children be? Will they be destroying or creating? 
Nothing that exists is too small to be honored. Each blue vase and yellow teapot, each splash of color, each item worn and used in honest work, each still life captured before any diminishment or decay, nuggets of the world crack open for us to muse over. Everything has its within. And our empathetic response extends to flora and fauna. Many archaeologists now speculate that women were most likely the first artist, painting these horses, perhaps. Lisa Bonheur painted these sheep by the sea. Animals on these canvases become metaphors for the human predicament, and according to some, a way in which Bonheur expressed her own frustrations with the strictures of society. Nancy Graves' father worked in a natural history museum, and she's interested in the world that can't be measured by numbers and statistics. She's also interested in this inside-out dichotomy. After she made these sculptures of camels, she turned to the fabrication of camels' bones, even hanging them from the ceiling so as not to be trapped into one way of seeing things. Is that not a gift we could all use right now? So much life other than ours. Nothing is too small to consider. Donna Beyer calls these pieces dream stones. Each is marked with a symbolic form that emerge from the artist's dreams. Lost civilizations are collective unconscious and shared mythologies. As Zadie Smith says, life just keeps on coming. Artists plumb the depths for us and sometimes remind us how our past perspectives might need correction. Renee Cox has created a series she's entitled Mama Donna in response to the dearth of images of women of color in the religious and artistic canon. Mala Andriala collages the landscape of her genealogy. Sude Davoid paints this woman in the background, two men with blue hats. What's happened? The horrors of the past seem dreamlike. We cannot turn away. Lisa Raihana's mural gives us a different narrative of colonization, attempting to tilt the scales of justice. Years ago, I read the diaries of a woman named Carolyn Maria de Jesus. She lived in the favelas in Rio de Janeiro and would have to go to get water at 5 a.m. each morning. When she witnessed an officer kicking a street orphan, she cried out to him, you stop that or I'll put you in my book. A journalist overheard her and a year later, her diaries were published giving the world a window into the everyday anguish of continual poverty. The beating by that one particular tyrant stopped. Breton entitled this, The Tormented. Oh, does there not seem to be enough torment in the world? Has there not been enough of brute force?
Shoshona Michael arranged this traditional Hebrew song, one that's often included in Passover services. We're looking at a weaving that Annie Albers made that's called Six Prayers. The artist Yishe Garbaz originally could not read her mother's 10,000 word manuscript about her experiences of imprisonment in five different concentration camps during the Holocaust. When she did so, much later, it became her mission to travel through Germany, the Netherlands, the Czech Republic and Poland to visually document the sites featured in her mother's account. Using a large format camera and making much of the year-long journey on foot, she slowed down this act of grief-filled recollection. This is what remains of a long abandoned and dilapidated German munitions factory. Listen to Karen Tanaka's Blue Planet. It makes me homesick for Earth, even though I'm still home. There is always something to be made of pain, says the poet Margaret Gibson. And something, I would add, to be made of hope. Anne Cady paints a utopian Earth Atel Adnan gives us a slip of blue deepening at the horizon. We look and suddenly the world looks back, says the poet Anne Michaels. Stephanie Pogue's moon is held in the V of the world. And at Storm King, Maya Lin makes the very landscape undulate. If this can happen, what else can we do in the name of life? Carla Accardi explores the tension between nomadism and home with this triple tent. On this planet with its snows, its rains, its perils, our planet overheating, glaciers crashing into rising seas, Maria Spateva's words echo over the century. Marina, we are the waves. Marina, we are the earth. Artists and their imaginations will lead next generations forward. A child, one who sometimes on Saturdays leans her hand against her cheek, for instance, might someday walk into the armory in a revived New York City and exclaim over an alternate world conceived of by Anne Hamilton. When this child moves through the air, her joy, her swinging will make this created space billow and shift. Our movements are making, they matter. They make things happen. There's magic there. As so often happens in life, we come back to where we started. In this case, to Chicago. This time to Symphony Hall, where Florence Beatrice Price's Symphony No. 4 premiered in 1933. To me, her spring intermezzo exudes joy. Artists console us with color and line and design. These women convince us that light exists in a realm all of its own and that we can access it.
We make things from scraps. Scrape beauty where we can. Over this past year, I've collaged some of my own dreamscapes, born of this project and filled with women watching over us, surrounded by flora and fauna, vibrant and bigger than life. What I've always loved about the page and the stage and the canvas, anything can bump up against something totally new and share the same space. And there's always a story in the making. The monkey's a despot escaped again from the organ grinder, and the fish was once full of a thousand wishes, but everyone whose hook landed in his mouth wanted so very much. Too much. Does the table remember being a tree, leafing toward blue, a thing of rings and sap, roots and rhizomes knit to the ground? worlds for us to live in. Who made that? I need to talk to her. The conversations continue.